this evening, please. Ezra chapter 4. Yeah, if there's not a Bible, uh, either just quickly move to a seat where there is one. The Bibles are the black books under the chair racks. Uh, make sure that you do have a Bible because we're going to see uh, some, some just great stories of God working. And we're going to see some things that, you know, if I told you, you maybe wouldn't believe it. But the Bible says it, and you know, so we know it's true. When you say again? Ezra chapter 4. So it would be like uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. And then Ezra. Isn't that true? Oh, it's not. It would be Nehemiah, Esther. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. I don't know. Yeah, the first Samuel's and oh, you want 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Samuel. Ezra? Okay. It's after 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd <coughs> Kings. First Second Chronicles. And it's way before Matthew. And shortly after Genesis. It's in the Old Testament. Is it in the Bible? Yeah, in the New Testament. Oh, okay. Glad to see you. Charlie and I almost didn't make it home. We left about midnight Sunday night and went to Georgia to get his stuff that's been there for about 10 years. He's been waiting to pick up his things. And we've been talking about it for less than 10 years, but we've been saying we're going to go get his stuff. We did it. We went and got it. Sunday night we left about the time that Taj came back from watching the Dolphins beat up on the Falcons. And so we left and went to look at Charlie Craig. <laughs> And uh, went to Georgia, spent the day there getting his stuff, and then we went to Shelby, North Carolina, to the courthouse and got his DD-214, a certified copy of it, so that he could do all the things that ex-military guys do with their paperwork. And then we went to uh, Ambassador Baptist College and went to the chapel service. And they had a guest speaker there, Dr. Bill Rice. So we got to see him, hear him preach. Saw them, went for a tour at that college, had a nice time. And then we went to um, see Jerry Walsh at Frank Calvary Hill Baptist Press, the one that printed our Genesis, John, and Romans. We had lunch with him at the Beacon. And then we went to um, then we went to see some more friends. If you all remember Tatiana, a friend of Charlie's, we went and saw her brother and his wife and had dinner with them, asked them to move to Fort Lauderdale. And then we went to, I'm not I'm serious. Uh, then we went to uh, see Sam Hood. I don't know how many of y'all remember Sammy. We went and, and uh, drank tea with Sammy. And then my car blew up. Not really, but uh, uh, part broke and there's no way to get the part. Nobody had the part. And plus it was 11 o'clock at night. And that was last night. We thought, oh man, we were in Spartanburg, South Carolina at the time. It's tough to get from Spartanburg to here in a very short amount of time. It takes 12 hours if everything's going well. and But things weren't going well. And so we're here, we made it, and we manufactured a part out of JB Weld. No kidding, we rednecked it. First we tried duct tape. We built a pulley out of duct tape. And it worked really good until we started to pull out the parking lot, and then it flew apart. And then we built a pulley out of JB Weld and literally drove here with no problems. And so if you all need a part manufactured for your car out of JB Weld, uh, give it a shot. It might work for you. Get you to church on time. It's great to get to church on time. I've been stressing since last night about making it here, so I'm glad to be here. And I got to grill hot dogs. Yes, Kelly? Yes, sir. Yes, we tried to visit Dustin Duke. He was in Charlotte, and we very nearly ran into him, but uh, he's going to have to come here and visit us. That's what we concluded. So it didn't work out because we, we accidentally... It, would, it just didn't work out. We tried. He tried. We tried but we were in the wrong places at the wrong time. So uh, we didn't go through Charlotte when we were, went through Charlotte. He wasn't there. And we went through Spartanburg. We went through Spartanburg. Uh, he wasn't there. So we, we traded swap places. So we saw some other people too. But uh, there's too many in the list and you don't know some of them. So, but that's, that's like Charlie's week. In case you all wonder what Charlie does on an average week. <laughs> I, went, I went and hung out with him just to see what, what, where is Charlie when he's always late. Uh, so <laughs> he gets around. <laughs> okay, 
That has nothing to do with our text tonight, but I hope I stalled long enough for you to find Ezra chapter 4. And if you have found Ezra chapter 4, we're going to read verse 1 and 2, and uh, and we will pray. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity built the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and unto them, and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. Uh, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Asser, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus the king of Persia hath commanded us. Now we'll pray. Father, I just ask that you would help us as we again look at hindrances, as we look at overcoming overcoming conflict, things that would keep us from seeing revival. I pray that you would help us to see the example of these people and how that you use their lives. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Cyrus the king had given a commission to rebuild the temple and really to rebuild Jerusalem. And not only commission it, but he'd also uh, commission that the gold and the silver and the vessels of the house of the Lord be brought in. Now, a lot of Ezra uh, overlaps with Nehemiah. And if you want to read and you want to study Nehemiah and you want to study Ezra, you also ought to read Haggai and uh, you ought to uh, read uh, Zechariah as well because uh, these all would be individuals that were influential in the coming back to Jerusalem and God's people coming to a point. And this, is, this is our point this evening. God's people coming to a place or a point where they experienced not only revival, but they actually were closer to God than Israel had been since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun. Now how close were God's people in the days of Joshua, the son of Nun? They had determined, didn't they? They said, Joshua said, as for me, he said, if it seem evil on you, serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And the people all said, we'll serve the Lord. And they had according to Nehemiah, Joshua, the people in the days of Joshua had kept the feast, they kept the law that they had entered into a contract with God to keep, and they had they had celebrated the feast of booths, but until the rebuilding of Jerusalem by Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the temple by Ezra, the scribes and the individuals mentioned here, till that time God's people had never really wholeheartedly with their whole heart served God. Oh, there had been good people. There had been people who partially, partly had served, but there just wasn't anybody that was all in for God. And if you were to read uh, Zechariah, one of the things that you would see is that this King Zerubbabel at the time, who really is one of the weakest kings in Israel's history with regard to his accomplishments politically, this King Zerubbabel as a king in Israel, had such a heart to serve God that God said there's never been a king like Zerubbabel. In spite of his minor achievements politically and physically, Zerubbabel was a king that 100% pleased God. And I want to remind you that it is not significant for us to build great riches in this life. It's not significant for us to, to conquer or capture great empires in this life. It's significant for us to serve God. And God can do great things. And so, now, th I love this, and if you've tuned out uh, tune back in a little bit because it, it's always fun to see a conflict and you see the you know the the antagonist and the protagonist and the good guy and the bad guy. Well, God's people are trying to worship God and they're trying to build a temple. And don't confuse it. The temple was for Israel and that was the way God said that people were to come to Him. He was going to dwell in the temple with Israel. That was the way they were supposed to worship God. Today, where's God at? Where? He's in heaven. Yeah, He's in heaven, right? God's in heaven. He's in the heavens. And He's not in a temple made with hands today. God is not. Uh, he is Christ is living in us. God's Spirit, when you receive Jesus as your Savior, God lives in you. Christ lives in you. That's that voice that you hear speaking to you. God's Holy Spirit. And He's living in you, but God is bodily, physically in heaven. Well, God dwelt with man in Israel. And so this was an important thing. So don't confuse the difference between the church and Israel. Uh, God is 
using the church today have used Israel in those days, but it's the same God. And when God's people began to build the temple, it was important because they needed the temple to worship God, right? Yes. Let's say it together. God's people needed the temple to worship God. Let's say it. God's people needed the temple to worship God. Okay, so how vital was it for God's people to have the temple? The utmost importance. Absolutely vital. They needed the temple to worship God. And so they're trying to build the temple, and the Bible says that the first thing that people did in order to try to stop them, there are always adversaries trying to stop God's work. And the Bible says when they heard in verse 1 of chapter 4 that the children of the captivity built the temple, they came to Zerubbabel. Now Zerubbabel is this good king. And to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assur, which brought us up hither. Now there, sadly, are many Christians that do not understand the principle or doctrine of separation. A lot of times people that do not have the intent or purpose of serving God want to partner with you in doing things that churches do or that ministries do, or in this case, that the Israelites did. So they came to Zerubbabel, the king of Israel, and said, hey, we're, yeah, we're, we like your God. We're for Him. We've, matter of fact, He's one of the gods we've worshipped. And so let us help you build. And here we find that Zerubbabel very, very plainly says, uh, no, you have nothing to do with us to build a house under our God. But we ourselves together will build on the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. I don't have anything identical to this, but in principle, this is one of the reasons I struggle with the chaplaincy, say, in the military. This is, this is I, again, I'm not preaching tonight about the chaplaincy. I'm not preaching against anything here this evening. Don't mistake me. I know people that I believe love the Lord, and they serve in the, in, as, as military chaplains. But it's really interesting to me, and I should, the word interesting is not the right word. It's confusing to me that a guy can be a chaplain and yet he can set up things um, for a Jewish service, knowing that Judaism as it's practiced today is not like the Israel in the Bible. It's, a, it's entirely different. And it actually, in concept, in an actual practice is anti-Jesus. And so a, a Christian in the military chaplaincy will set up the, the, the service for the Jews. And he'll set up a service for the Muslims or for the Catholics or whatever because he's required to do so. He can't be, you know, he can believe what he believes and when he preaches his Baptist service, he can preach what he preaches, but if he's deployed, he has to be all things to all men. And it's kind of like the government saying, hey, we're all for worshiping God. We think religion is really good for our soldiers, and so let's partner together. And let's, you know, let's do worship. The problem is, unsaved people don't do worship. And that's the deal here. The deal here is that these people are wanting to be able to have a way of actually having some control. By the way, let me just say this. Don't get it silly and extreme about this, but when the government gets involved with ministry, it's not getting involved with ministry because, you know, the entity wants to worship God. Entities don't worship God, do they? Organizations don't worship God, do they? No. Individuals do. So if the government's trying to get involved in ministry, mark my words, it's not because the government was trying to worship God, it's because individuals in the entities are trying to find a way to hinder the work of God. It's a fact. Trying to find a way to say, okay, if you take, they'll get, we'll give you support, we will help you with things, and then along with the support and the help for things are going to come some restrictions. See, the fact is, is that these individuals are fine with God being worshipped as long as people don't get too serious about it. And that's the deal. As long as you don't get too serious about it, we'll do it too. We don't want anybody going all in worshipping God. You know why? You know why? Well, first, because they themselves don't believe. But 
The second reason they don't want people is because it will bring them conviction. And thirdly, because God will change things. God will shake. I'm going to tell you, God will shake up the world if you worship Him. Things will get shaken up. And people don't want that. They want to be in control. They don't want God to be in control. But when you wholeheartedly worship God with all your heart, God will take control. And God will do some amazing things, miraculous things. And so, here we find one way of opposition, of course, is if you can't beat them, join them. And hey, we know as well in uh, Nehemiah, don't we, that Sanballat, Tobiah, the same people that opposed the rebuilding of the temple and opposed the rebuilding of the walls and the gates, who ended up living in the temple? <laughs> who ended up living in the temple? Tobiah. Yeah, who ended up marrying his daughter off to a Levite priest? <laughs> Tobias. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, the guy that opposed the work from the beginning with all his heart and soul. Now, how did he get involved? Why did he get involved with it? To hinder it, that's why. You wonder why people who don't love the Lord are trying to help you, my friend. I just want to tell you something. They're not trying to help you. They're trying to hinder you. They're trying to be an encumbrance to you. The church is full of encumbrances today. We're full of affiliations, affiliations and associations that are taking our time, and taking our focus, and taking our energy. And we as Christians need to have a crystal clear understanding of who we are and what the ministry is. And I'll tell you something, I don't want to, I want to preach the whole counsel of God. I want to preach everything. But I don't want to get sidetracked preaching some of the things if I'm not going to be preaching the gospel first and foremost. And I've found there's a lot of things that, you know, you can see the need to do. But if, if you're not preaching the gospel, you're not doing the main thing. You know, we just need to be such a gospel pre preaching church that we can be criticized for it and we can just undergo the criticism for it and just say, you know what, and that will just galvanize us because we know what we're supposed to be doing. You know what happens when we really focus in this ministry on preaching the gospel? People get saved. Don't they? I mean, when... You tell me. When have we tried to reach the lost and invested time and effort and focus in it and not had lost people get saved? Never. We have never focused on saying, you know, we need to do something to preach the gospel. We need to reach some lost people and done that and not had people get saved. When we do what we're supposed to do, God always does what He does. And so that's all I want to preach tonight. I want to share that to you. I want to submit that to you. And next week we're going to see some more opposition. But in order to have revival, my friend, you and I need to have a clear sense of purpose. And we need to have a clear focus. And we need to be careful who and what we let get ourselves get associated with. I think sometimes it's, it, to me, is rather tragic how that churches, which I believe would be unstoppable, and their influence for Jesus Christ somehow gets stopped. Sometimes I see them get stopped because their pastor gets put on a board or a committee or he starts getting asked to preach a lot of places. You know, you see a guy who gets to be a good preacher and people are getting saved in his church and he gets to be sought after preacher. Pretty soon he's not preaching in his church anymore. He's preaching everywhere else. And sadly, you know, he's famous maybe because of what his church has done, but it's not doing it anymore. Mm. You know, sometimes things come up. Sometimes I, I know I know men that get uh, that are pastors. I don't know why pastors do this. To be honest with you, I'm not criticizing anybody for it. I'm just saying I don't know why. I'm not saying there isn't a good reason. You understand the difference? But I I know pastors. You know they get involved with um, missions programs. You say, Pastor, what's wrong with missions program? Nothing in the world. But why is a guy, or how is a guy going to preach the gospel and, and be in charge of an organization to reach the lost? So it's how can you do both? You know, I know pastors, it's like they spend all their time doing everything but pastoring their churches. You know, I, I'm not saying you can't do any of those things. I think, you know, I guess we need pastors to do some of those things. I'm just saying we need to have a crystal clear purpose and direction. And we need to know that our purpose is to preach the gospel. And we need to just be so one track, so bent on it, 
that we don't get sidetracked. Don't take anything I said this evening and make an extreme out of it. I'm not trying to be extreme. I'm trying to be focused. And I believe if we're going to see revival in our church, that's why we're preaching on this for folks. We want to see revival. I don't want to look at how people have revival. I want to have revival. Don't you? And so I think if we want to have revival, we need to get focused and look at what's necessary. People are going to die and perish in eternity if we don't preach the gospel. That's what we're supposed to do. And we just need to be bulldog determined that we're going to do what our purpose is. And when we see ourselves getting off on some other things, we need to just get right back to what we do. We can have ministries that do things for what purpose? So the gospel can be preached. One of the things we've got to be careful about, though, same thing that Zerubbabel was careful about here. Don't get yourself aligned with people that say they're with you, but actually their purpose is to distract you. I find myself so easily filling my schedule with things that aren't my calling. So easy to fill my schedule with things that aren't my calling. And I know it's true for all of us, it isn't just me. And ultimately, it isn't a mystery who's behind that. It's not God. And so let's let's get our focus. Let's focus on seeing God do great things. I like to end the year that way. You know, it's it's hard for me to think that man, we're already on the we're already already on the other side of the year. You know, you we're not at the beginning of the year, we're ending out our year. And we need to end our year preaching the gospel strongly. Wouldn't it be great if 2017 we saw more people saved than we ever have before? Well, we've had some pretty good years in our past, but wouldn't it be great if 2017? I'm not saying I'm not going to ask to see more in 2018 than 2017. But what I'm saying is, wouldn't it be great if 2017 was the best year ever? And so, if it's going to be, we've got to be careful. we got some great things coming up, don't we? We've got some great holidays where we acknowledge God, Thanksgiving and Christmas, and we've got uh, fun things that we do for those things. Those are great things. But we don't want to celebrate holidays and not preach the Gospel. We want to use the holidays to preach the Gospel. So let's just be clear in our focus. We don't want to associate with people who will hinder us. We want to dissociate with anyone who would hinder us and get God's work done. Father, I pray that You'd help us to do the work. Help us to be crystal clear in what it is that we're trying to accomplish for You and help us to realize that it's the church's purpose to preach the Gospel. God, I thank You for... Uh, the just the variety of the people that are here tonight. Thank you for the young. Thank you for the not so young. Thank you for each person who is is here because they believe in a God that can do great things. And I pray that we would be able to see you do great things. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Shall we take some prayer requests?